All right, everyone, welcome back. In this video, we will cover a brief but high yield review of lysosomal storage diseases. These are super high yield. The NBME loves going after these, especially on step one, but you can always see these show back up on a pediatric shelf or even on step two or step three. So we'll start with some practice questions. We will do a review of each of these disorders, and then we'll present some high yield kind of review summary slides that you can save for a quick memory jog in the future. So let's go ahead and start. The nine month old male presents to the clinic for follow-up. He was born via uncomplicated spontaneous vaginal delivery and his parents report no pertinent family history. His older sister has no significant medical conditions. He initially progressed through normal developmental milestones but his parents have noticed more frequent falls when attempting to stand. On fundoscopic exam, there is a reddish area at the macula and his liver and spleen appear large on physical exam. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? A is Fabry disease, B Tay-Sachs, C Crabbe, D Gaucher, E Neiman Picks disease. I'll pause here for a minute. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move on to the answers here. So the answer to this one was Neiman Picks disease. So again, I've bolded the high yield things to keep in track of in the question that they'll go after. And we'll talk about these on the next slide. So more frequent falls when attempting to stand, especially when someone was initially reaching normal developmental milestones is what they're describing as neurodegeneration. And the fundoscopic exam, when you see a reddish area at the macula, you know they're probably talking about the classic cherry red spot is how it's often known. And the liver and spleen being enlarged is another high yield point that leads you towards Neiman Pick disease. So let's review Tay Sachs and Neiman Pick disease. And the reason to put these on a separate slide is that they love, love, love to have you distinguish between these two diseases. So this whole topic, it's easiest to separate it into deficient enzyme, accumulated substance, and also high yield clinical presentation. Keep in mind, there's inheritance patterns for all of these diseases, and it's important that you know them. And kind of a high yield trick to remember inheritance patterns is that things that are enzyme deficiency are most commonly autosomal recessive. And why is that? Because you're missing a gene leading to a defect in a protein. And so that's a loss of function mutation. And so autosomal recessive, you typically need two of the recessive genes to have that take effect. And so most often you'll see autos autosomal recessive patterns with diseases where you're losing an enzyme, so enzyme deficiencies. So the vast majority of these that we talk about today will be autosomal recessive. So if you don't see that on the slide, assume that it's autosomal recessive. We'll only make note when there's an exception. So it's much easier to remember inheritance patterns when you remember the exceptions and not every single one. So these both are autosomal recessive. So the def deficient enzyme for Tay-Sachs is hexosaminidase A. An easy way to remember that is the A in Tay-Sachs and Tay-Sachs, the word Tay sounds like the letter A. For Neiman Pick disease, the deficient, deficient enzyme is sphingomyelinase. And so the mnemonic there that people use is you use your sphingo, so your finger to pick your nose. So sphingo and pick, that's an easy way to remember the deficient enzyme. So the accumulated substance for Tay-Sachs is the GM2, so it's a ganglioside. And then unsurprisingly for Neiman Pick, it, you don't have to remember anything else. If you have a loss of sphingomyelinase, you can't break down sphingomyelin, and so you accumulate sphingomyelin. And so the highest yield information here is the clinical presentation. So they both have neurodegeneration. They both have a cherry red macula. So in a pediatrics question, when they're going after a cherry red macula, it's often these two that they're talking about. So the reason you get a cherry red macula is not because there's some sort of red spot at the center of the eye. It's an over amplification of the fovea because of the accumulated substance in the remainder of the retina. So if you're wondering why the macula is red, it's because the surrounding retina is more light. And so it makes the macula more prominent. And so here's where we get to the differences. So Tay-Sachs has what they call onion skin lysosomes. So if you see any picture of something that looks onion skin, so concentric rings, you know they're talking about Tay-Sachs versus lipid-laden macrophages, sometimes called foam cells, you'll see in Neiman-Pick disease. So you'll be see the classic picture of the 
white looking circles, which is the lipids accumulating in the macrophages. So those are pretty easy to distinguish via a picture on a histology slide. And then what I think is the highest yield information here is at the end. So they almost always like to distinguish these two solely based on the hepatosplenomegaly. So Tay-Sachs, you will not see hepatosplenomegaly and with neiman picks you will. So the last question could have been either between the two Tay-Sachs or neiman picks The only way you could tell the difference is based on the hepatosplenomegaly. And then a not quite as often tested, but another high yield point is that Tay-Sachs presents as an upper motor neuro nerve lesion, so hyperreflexia and neiman picks often presents as a lower motor neuron a reflexia so if they give you neurologic exam keep those in mind as well but again they'll often test it based on the liver and spleen so just look look for that when you distinguish between these two and bold that in your own mind so let's go on to the next question a 12 month old male presents to the clinic with reports of hip pain his parents have noted that over the past few months he has refused to walk after initially taking steps without difficulty Physical exam is remarkable for hepatosplenomegaly and scattered petechiae. Laboratory studies demonstrate pancytopenia. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Fabry disease, Tay-Sachs, Crabbe, Gaucher, neiman pick disease, or metachromatic leukodystrophy? I'll pause here briefly. Okay, we'll go to the answer choice on this one. So the answer is Gaucher disease. And the bolded points here are the high yield. So the hip pain and that presentation of refusing to walk because of the pain is high yield presentation for avascular necrosis of the, the hip, hepatosplenomegaly, scattered petechiae, and then pancytopenia are also very, very high yield for Gaucher disease. So let's talk about these next few lysosomal source diseases. So again, all of these have an inheritance pattern. The first three are autosomal recessive, and Fabry disease is excellent recessive. So again, I didn't make note of that because you should assume that lysosomal storage diseases and other enzyme deficiencies where you're losing a function of an enzyme are usually going to be autosomal recessive. So Gaucher disease, the deficient enzyme is glucose cerebrosidase. And so we have that picture here. So you can always reference picture to rem remember which one is which. So the deficient enzyme is glucose cerebrosidase, and of course the accumulated substance is glucose cerebroside. And so pancytopenia, hepatosplenomegaly due to extra, extra medullary hematopoiesis, avascular necrosis, and oftentimes it happens in the femur, right? Because of the limited and very focal blood supply in the, in the femoral head, and then Gaucher cells. So Gaucher cells are kind of like the lipid-laden macrophages in neiman pick disease. The difference is the reason they're called Gaucher cells is because they're said to resemble, resemble crumbled tissue paper. So they look a lot, there's a lot more of these like white lines through the macrophage. And so it looks a little bit more distinct than the typical foam cells, which is more specific to neiman picks and can be seen in other conditions as well. And then for Crabbe disease, which is over here, the deficient enzyme for Crabbe disease is beta-galactosidase, but it's also called galactocerebrosidase. And so you can sometimes see these two interchanged, but that's the deficient enzyme leading to the accumulated substance of the galactocerebroside. And high yield for Crabbe disease is you have peripheral neuropathy, you have optic atrophy, so you can lead to blindness, and then globoid cells as well, which is a very unique cell that's seen in Crabbe disease. Next, we have metachromatic leukodystrophy. The deficient enzyme is aerosulfatase A, and so you're losing the effect of a sulfatase. The sulfatide you specifically have buildup of is cerebroside sulfate. So you can see sulfatides more generically or cerebroside sulfate more specifically. And the high yield thing for metachromatic leukodystrophy is you have both central and peripheral demyelination. So central can lead to sort of a encephalopathic picture and central disturbances and peripheral demyelination can lead to focal and peripheral nerve kind of issues. So they'd like to test this. Oftentimes they don't test this in clinical presentation, but they will just say both of those things. And then dementia and ataxia. And the ataxia can sometimes can be mostly from the central demyelination. And then we have Fabry disease. So the deficient enzyme is alpha-galactosidase A, and the accumulated substance is ceramide trihexoside, which is right here. 
So again, this is the first mention in these four conditions because ceramide trihexoside within Fabry disease is an excellent recessive condition. So I've bolded the X in trihexoside because that can sometimes help remind you, okay, the accumulated substance has a hex in it. And so I think that this is the excellent recessive one. It can be a hint in your head. And so the high yield for this is you start with a triad of peripheral neuropathy, but again, it's only peripheral, unlike metachromatic leukodystrophy, angiokeratomas. So if you see red blood vessels kind of protruding from the skin, that's a good hint. And hypohydrosis um, is the initial triad, but it eventually progresses. If they ask you what's the long-term complication, look for kidney or heart failure. That's oftentimes how they test this. And so remember, if you can... Picture these deficient enzymes, what they accumulate, and then remember the high yield differences between the presentations. You'll be able to get these questions right more often than not. And oftentimes it's best to centralize your memory on a picture and reference this picture sort of as an image in your head rather than trying to rote memorize each fact from each condition. Okay, we'll move on to the next slide. So these last two, are again, oftentimes compared between each other. So I put these on separate slides. So Hunter system syndrome and Hurler syndrome. So these are technically lysosomal storage diseases, but what we've talked about so far are sphingolipidoses. These are mucopolysaccharidoses. So the accumulated substances are a little bit different. It's not high yield to remember the differences between those two, but what it is high yield to remember is distinguishing Hunter's from Hurler syndrome. So for Hunter syndrome, the deficient enzyme is iduronate 2-sulfatase. And if you notice, there's two Ts and the only there's a T in Hunter syndrome. That's an easy way to remember this enzyme. You don't have to remember the name on a multiple choice exam. You'll just have to recognize the name. And so the T is a good hint that it's Hunter syndrome. Versus Hurler syndrome, the deficient enzyme is alpha l iduronidase, which again, there's an L that's bolded there because there's an L in Hurler syndrome. And if you notice... There's no T's in Hurler syndrome and there's no L's in Hunter syndrome. So that's a very foolproof way of remembering Hurler and Hunter syndrome if you don't want to memorize outright the full enzyme name. The accumulated substances in high yield, it's the same between both heparin and dermatan sulfate. And the high yield things here is they both have the same general presentation, developmental delay, um, abnormal facies. But what's different about Hunter syndrome is you have aggressive behavior so remember, hunters in this situation, a good way to remember this, hunter being aggressive, and then no corneal clouding. So hunters can see clearly is the way to remember that. And Hurler syndrome, you have a more prominent gargoylism. So you can have a mild form of that in hunter syndrome, but that's more prominent in Hurler syndrome, and you do have corneal clouding. So the hunter can see clearly, but the Hurler syndrome has corneal clouding. And again, only making mention of these when there's exceptions, Hurler's follows the standard autosomal recessive pattern for these enzyme deficiencies, and Hunter's disease is X-linked recessive. And what's a good way to remember this? So the Hunter hits the X on the target, so it's X-linked recessive. So the only two we've talked about in this video are Hunter syndrome is X-linked recessive, and Fabry disease is X-linked recessive. The rest of them you don't have to remember, you know it's autosomal recessive. So the first questions when you see that there's not a family history that's classic of autosomal recessive versus X-linked recessive, you may see the pattern of a mother passing it to the son, but the mother th themselves didn't have the condition because there were two X chromosomes. So an X-linked recessive condition wouldn't appear in a female, but a male has one chromosome. So an X-linked recessive condition will appear. So it will be the mother passing the X chromosome onto the son, which will cause the disease. So you won't see a family history in either of these because autosomal recessive requires two of the deficient mutations, carriers of these conditions that eventually develops an autosomal recessive in one of the children. But very rarely, it's about 25% of the time if you remember your inheritance charts. So let's go over some high yield findings on this slide. So what is this depicting an image of? I'll go ahead and move to the answer. So this is what I was describing earlier, which is a Gaucher cell. So if you notice, it's a macrophage with these kind of lines scattered throughout and a little bit of some lipid accumulation here. So this is a Gaucher cell. It's a foam cell that kind of crumples up into a tissue paper appearance, high yield for a Gaucher disease. What is this cell? 
moving to the answer, we have, this is what's a foam cell. So if you notice, much more prominent development of these lipids accumulating within the cells. And here's a depiction of what these lipid droplets look like in sort of a descriptive picture of it. And so what was this seen in? This is what's we were describing in Neiman-Pick disease. Those are the typical foam cells in Neiman-Pick's disease. Okay, we'll talk about this one next. The answer to this one is, this is what we call the cherry red macula or the cherry red spot on the macula. And so again, it's because of this relative hypo attenuation of the rest of the surrounding area of the retina, which causes prominence of the macula. Nothing specifically is happening from the macula itself. Remember the macula gets separate blood flow from the rest of the retina. And so it maintains this red appearance from its highly vascularized center. And last, we have this cell here. So the answer to this one is this is an onion skin lysosome. So remember, these concentric rings give you a hint that it's onion skin. You can see these in many vascular conditions that concentrically develop this appearance in blood cells. But if you see this in a lysosomal storage disease question, no, they're talking about these onion skin lysosomes, which occur in Tay-Sachs disease. So that's a high yield thing for Tay-Sachs disease that won't be seen in Neiman picks. So we talked about hepatosplenomegaly being a great way to distinguish Tay-Sachs from Neiman picks. Foam cells in Neiman picks, onion skin lysosomes in Tay-Sachs is another big way to just distinguish these two. And so last, we have a summary slide here. We've already talked about these, so this is a lot of information on one slide, but nothing we haven't covered. So in bold is all of the high yield things to keep track of between the conditions. The colors associate to the respective condition. If you keep this as sort of a central picture in your head, you can remember what enzyme is deficient, what substance accumulates, and then what that leads to in presentation. And so you know which ones to distinguish from the others, and then which ones are kind of their own single standing condition. And remember, all of these are default autosomal recessive, except for Hunter's disease, which is X-linked recessive, and Fabry disease, which is X-linked recessive. So if you remember the deficient enzyme, the accumulated substance, the high yield presentation, and then if they give any hints about, about inheritance pattern, you know how to think through that you'll be on your way to getting these questions right the vast majority of the time. So feel free to save this slide as a review slide and as a good way to reference back when you're reviewing these disorders. If you found this video helpful or benefited from the content at all, feel free to drop a comment below and don't forget to subscribe as well and stay tuned for more videos in the future.